So I'd like to start with a question. How, who can tell me uh, what season it is right now, especially more on the church calendar? Can anyone give me the answer? Lent. Okay, there's an overwhelming response. Lent. That's correct. Hey, just by show of hands, um, how many people here know that this is the, this is the season of Lent? You're, you're aware of this fact. Most of you? Yes. Maybe just by a show of hands, how many people um, are maybe even giving up something for the season of Lent too? Anybody giving up some things for Lent? Okay, good. Lent is, a, Lent is that kind of season. It's the 40 days before Easter. It's the time where we give up some things in preparation for Easter as we prepare our hearts, as we prepare our minds for the celebration of Easter, well, for the Good Friday, and then for the celebration of Easter as well. You might not know this, but uh, Lent actually is 46 days because those Sundays that are in, in, in between are actually celebration Sundays too, where if you want to, you could actually um, go back and celebrate and, and stop your fasting that particular Sunday too and, uh, and go, through, go through it that way as well. But the, uh, the idea of fasting and where this idea of Lent came from is uh, from the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness as he prepared for his ministry um, on earth. And so we too can spend a chunk of time fasting, giving up something so that we can remember God, so that we can give, get, re- receive something back um, for God, that we can have more communion with God in that way. And Lent is something that... Nowadays, sometimes we, we don't go through it in the, in the right motive sometimes. Sometimes people are just in the, in the practice of, well, let's, I'll give up chocolate for Lent or I'll give up coffee for Lent. And it's more become a, a, a self-discipline thing or perhaps just a health thing. And, uh, and that's okay too. Actually, I have heard, I don't know if this is true, but perhaps you've heard too, that Tim Hortons actually does the roll-up to rim uh, you know, celebration with the, the, the prizes during the season of Lent because they don't want people to give up coffee for Lent. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that somewhere. So there, there's people out there that are trying to mess with you, all right? So, so Lent, I thought, um, I thought if you haven't given up anything for Lent, you know what? We are two weeks into the, uh, two plus weeks into the season of Lent. There's still about four weeks. It's still a practice you could, uh, you could take on as you uh, look forward to Easter, as we prepare ourselves for Easter. So I thought I'd give just a few uh, well, humorous uh, examples of, or suggestions of how you might be able to give something up for Lent. And maybe you've seen some of these uh, little ads or cartoons on, uh, online, but uh, here, here are some for you. This year for Lent, I want to give up having to shovel snow during the next 40 days. That's me. That's me. I know that when we had snow in the forecast for this weekend, I thought, oh no, here we go again. I'm giving up my New Year's resolutions for Lent. (laughs) Now's a good time. There you go. I don't know if that's how it's supposed to work, but there you are. It's official. I'm giving up parenting for Lent. I think that might work (laughs) in reverse for that person, but as a parent, I can relate. Giving up Facebook for Lent has allowed me more time for my Twitter addiction. That's not how it's supposed to work. Don't give up an addiction for another addiction, okay? No. I know a few people that should give up breathing for Lent. Oh, that's just mean. How'd that slide get in there? That shouldn't be there. No. For Lent, I'm giving up making jokes about what I'm giving up for Lent. Okay? Well, we've got one more joke for you anyways. This year for Lent, I'm just giving up. So (laughs) maybe some of you feel that way. Sometimes we can. I'm going to get my Bible down here because I want it and I need it. (laughs) We do have a serving elder that offered to get it for me. Thank you, Joe. The idea of giving up is an idea that I was exploring a little bit and uh, and reading through personally um, some of the some of the teachings of Jesus. I was working through John chapter three. And it's the story of uh, Jesus and Nicodemus. You probably all know this story. But in the season of Lent, thinking about, thinking about giving up something, it's more than just giving it up. There is a, there's a surrender attitude and motivation behind it. It's surrendering something so that we can be closer to God. It's surrendering something so that we can be more in communion with God. 
And as I was reading through the story of Nicodemus, I thought, there's some things here that Jesus is asking Nicodemus to surrender as well. And we've heard other stories uh, of Jesus, for example, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to follow you? And he said, give up all your possessions, sell them to the poor, and come follow me. Surrender those things and follow me. There are other stories like that where Jesus has asked people to surrender things. And in this particular case, um, Jesus is asking Nicodemus to surrender. I, I can pick out three things. So as we read through this passage, it'll be on the screen for you too. See if there's some ideas or things that you can pick out that you see Jesus asking Nicodemus to surrender. So it's John chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 1 to 16. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I want to start right there in verse 16. One thing I was noticing in this, passage is, in this passage is that words matter. Jesus is very particular in the words that he relates here to Nicodemus. And the first word here I want to pick up on in verse 16, for God so loved the world. That little word, so. In the English language, it's two letters. Now this word, in the original, in the text, is actually not a descriptive word, like God so much loved the world. That's not describing how much he loved the world. It's actually a Greek word, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. The Greek word is houtos. It's pronounced houtos, which actually is translated as in a similar way, or as such, or thus, or so. So Jesus is saying, essentially, in such a way, God loved the world. Well, then we have to ask, well, in what way does God love the world? See, this word is more of a connective word to the thought previous. In fact, if you, in, in, the, Greek, in the Greek text, Greek under, the understanding of the, uh, the way they, they write, at, write out their, their sentences is that they have multiple word endings so that in the Greek, you can tell which word relates to which word based on the ending of that word. So they have a lot of freedom to move words around in the sentence where they f- see fit. You know, for us in the English, we don't have that sort of freedom. So we would say, for example, uh, God loves you. Now, if we wanted to put the emphasis on loves, we would say, God loves you. If we wanted to put the emphasis on you, God loves you. But in the Greek, in the text, when it's written out, they can actually put the emphasis by putting the word they want to emphasize at the beginning of the sentence. And in fact, in this case, that little word so, houtos, is actually at the very beginning of the sentence. So it would read more like, in such a way, for God loved the world. And the Greeks would understand that. So it's more of a connecting 
word than it is a descriptive word of the, how much God loves. And even if it's not a direct connection, Christ in this teaching connects John 3.16 back to the previous thought. And what was that previous thought? Well, the previous thought was Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So in such a way, God loves the world, just like he loved the people of the Israelites when Moses lifted up the serpent. Well, let's go back. If you have a hard copy, we're going back to Numbers chapter 21. I like, there's something about having a hard copy I enjoy. 1,500 years earlier is when this happened prior to Christ. It's this seemingly random story, to be honest, um, of the Israelites wandering through the desert. They're, they're conquering lands. They're, they're, reclaim, they're claiming the promised land that God has promised them. But then this happens. So in Numbers 21, starting at verse 4, it reads, The people of Israel set out, taking the road to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. Beforehand, the land of Edom, the kingdom of Edom, threatened to uh, fight them, bring out the armies and, and attack them. So Israel decided, we will go around. So they're going around the land of Edom, the long way. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak out against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. When I first read that passage, it just, it just seemed, oh, so the, the Lord sent poisonous snakes. It just sent so matter-of-factly, like that's what the Lord does. He sent poisonous snakes. Now, this is, you know, as a parent, you know, I, I can relate to, you know, grumpy kids who are impatient with the long drive. Are we there yet? Or complaining about their supper. I hate this food. But poisonous snakes, folks, this is not a, uh, this is not a parenting how-to manual here. This is historical narrative. This is God, all right? This is God. This is not us. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. And then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze, attached it to a pole, and then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. So in such a way, God loves the world. In such a way, God sent his son. God's in the business of redemption, of redeeming, of healing. And in this particular case, the Israelites were complaining against God. They were complaining against God and his ways, against Moses and his leadership. And they just started picking up things to complain about, the long journey, the horrible food that they're sick and tired of. And so God sent judgment upon them because of their rebellious nature. And that judgment ended up being death for a lot of these people. And it's conceivable to, 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 to see that perhaps God could have just as rightly allowed all of the Israelites to die by, by poisonous snake bites. But he didn't. He sent a way for people to be healed. A really crazy way, seemingly from our perspective, but he said, Moses, make a, make a rod and a bronze snake on there to, so that people would look at it and be healed. If they were bitten, they could be healed. This is a symbol, actually, you probably recognize. You've probably seen it um, all over the place. In fact, as I have uh, been preparing this message, the more and more I've seen this little this, this symbol, you'll see it mostly on uh, you know, medical uh, uniforms or, medical, or the ambulance or in the hospital, the, the snake on a pole. I've got a few examples here on the slide to see there are you know, the emergency medical team. You see the Canadian Dental Association, um, all these different places. And this is, these are just four in Canada. Um, that still use today this symbol of healing. Now, 
in the history of all this, you know, this particular rod and bronze serpent was actually kept by the Israelite nation. And in fact, just to show you how messed up people are, the Israelites started worshiping that pole again, that bronze serpent again. And you read in, in, in the book, one of the first or second kings, where King Hezekiah had to just destroy that rod. He broke it into pieces because people were so messed up and worshiping this idol again. It had not become uh, an object of healing. It became an object of worship, which was not what it was intended for. And in fact, uh, throughout history, such idol worship to that bronze serpent became so prevalent that actually the ancient Greeks and Romans took on that worship too. And uh, it's called the rod of Alscephius or something like that. It's a, it's a god who has this, this rod with a bronze snake on it, and he's the, the god of you know, healing and, and health. And even just I, I, in my study, saw that even in 2010, the country of Greece still had that god with the snake and the rod on their currency. It was still there. So this has had a long-standing history. But nevertheless, this was something for people of the Israelites to look to and be healed. They could still have life. So in such a way, God loves the world. In such a way, God loves us in that though there is justice, though there is judgment and justice, yet God provides grace. In his justice and by his grace, God loves the world. So Jesus compares himself to that that he is the one that God has sent, that anyone who will believe in him can have life. So what is Jesus asking Nicodemus to surrender here in this particular case? I would say that Jesus is asking Nicodemus to surrender his way for God's way. As you know, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. And uh, he he lumped himself into um, all the people, all of his own uh, accomplices and, and, uh, and, and acquaintances, other religious leaders, when he said, you know, we know that you have come from God. And so he, he's, he's part of this group. And Jesus says, you can't understand it because if I told you earthly things and you don't believe how will you believe heavenly things, plural? How can you do that? So he's lumping himself into this religious Pharisee group. And Jesus knows the hearts of people too. If you look just two verses prior to John chapter 3, it says Jesus was doing miraculous signs in Jerusalem at the Passover, and many began to trust him, but Jesus didn't trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. So if, if Nicodemus had his own way, if he came to him at night, maybe there's a bit of pride seeping in there. Why did he come to him at night? We're not too sure, but perhaps there's a little bit of pride. Perhaps he didn't want to be seen speaking with Jesus. So I think in this particular case, when you look at the reference to Moses and the bronze serpent, Jesus is asking Nicodemus, surrender your will for my way. A second phrase that uh, stuck out to me in this is near the beginning of the passage, actually, where Jesus says, you must be born again. To remind you, he says, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some interesting conversation going on here because Nicodemus shows up And he says, you know, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. No one can do these signs unless God is with them. We've seen you do these signs, Jesus. But then, and and so we've seen you do these signs. We think that you're from God. Jesus said, no, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is turning his words back on him. Oh, you see me as this? Well, actually, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And again, words matter. Because this word again, born again, is an interesting word that Jesus chooses here. Because in the narrative, it doesn't just mean again. Okay, here's your Greek lesson number two. Let's see what we got up here on the slide. This Greek word is called, it's pronounced anathen. 
I'm not a Greek expert. I just did some little research, and it makes me look good up here, all right? <laughs> this word anathen, born anathen, means again, or means anew, or means from above. Actually, some of our English translations actually translate that as you are born, you must be born from above. So there's this element of, it's not just a second time, it's not just new or fresh, but born from above. And Jesus, of course, speaks into that when he talks about things that are born of the Spirit, our spirit, right? And so there's this interesting way that Nicodemus responds then. Well, how can a man be born when he is old? He's, talking, he's, he's thinking about a second time, a second birth, an, an again birth. And Jesus says, he, oh, so he, he replies, how can he be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? He cannot enter into his mother's womb. Then Jesus turns his words back on him again. He says, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so there's this interesting, interesting narrative going on there where Jesus is taking the words that Nicodemus brings to him and brings them back to him and says, actually, this is the way it is. You can't see me for who I am unless you're born again. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you come through me if you are born by the water and, and spirit. And there's an interesting phrase there, born of water and spirit. That particular phrase has been uh, interpreted in various ways as well. As it's, it's, it's rather, it's only once does it really happen um, in this conversation. Jesus drops that word water as he talks about being born of the spirit later on. Some people have thought that being born of water and spirit, that water is a, uh, a reference to baptism, which is a possibility. Um, in the context of John, we've seen John the Baptist baptizing earlier. And in fact, right after this passage, there's more about John the Baptist and Jesus' disciples baptizing as well. So there is that possibility. Um, we've, there's other people have interpreted this water, what it means to be born of water and spirit. Uh, born of water could mean uh, the word, just simply God's word. Um, we've seen uh, Peter when he, he says, you were, the seed, you were born from the seed of God, um, the word of God and spirit. So it could be um, receiving the word too. And those, those interpretations um, might be okay. I, what I do appreciate about them is the attitude that is uh, involved in the person who was born of water and spirit. That the attitude of baptism was one of repentance, is one of, again, giving up and surrendering oneself to God and his ways. Um, the, perhaps when, it's, when we talk about the water as word, receiving the word, that one needs to be open to the teaching of the word, to the, to the work of the word. So there's that humility and humbleness there too. But actually, I think that a third option might be actually the best option uh, in light of the way Jesus talks to Nicodemus here. And that's actually found in, in the, the prophet of Ezekiel, chapter 36. And I'll read a bit of that for you here. Actually, I've got that on the screen too, and I'll ask Astrid to use those slides forward. And so this is a passage of the prophets of Ezekiel that, as you know, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, would and should be familiar with this passage, if not have it memorized. Part of the ancient Jewish uh, educational system and the religious leaders, what they would do to train was is just memorize the scriptures. Most of the boys would have the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, memorized. And most of the religious leaders who went on from there to become religious leaders would memorize most of, if not all of, the Old Testament that we know as the Old Testament. And so Nicodemus should have this in mind when Jesus says you must be born of water and spirit. Well, here's a reference to water and spirit in the prophets. And the reference is how God will redeem his people. He says, verse 24, I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. I'll give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations." 
and you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. So when Jesus says, you must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God, and then Nicodemus' response back was, how can these things be? It makes sense that Jesus would say, wait, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? You don't remember this? You don't understand what this passage in Ezekiel might mean? It's a sprinkling, it's a cleaning, it's a cleansing, it's a removing of guilt, and then, and, and then a, a God putting in a new heart, a heart that's responsive to the work of the Spirit. God also puts the Holy Spirit in His people, a, a Spirit that presses in on that heart, that Im- impresses itself on the heart so that we can live out what the Spirit desires and, and what God wants and His will in our lives. And so, if we're cleansed from our guilt and we have a receptive heart to the Holy Spirit, what is Jesus asking Nicodemus to surrender in this case? Well, I would say that he's asking Nicodemus to surrender his wisdom and understanding for God's wisdom and understanding. The third third place where I think there is an ask of Jesus here for Nicodemus to surrender is in the following verse, verse 8. Jesus says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Again, words matter. And Jesus here is using another word picture. Just like born again, born from above, he's, he's using words in another word picture because the word for spirit and wind is actually the same word in, in the Greek. Pneuma, pronounced pneuma. You'll see this word twice in this passage, referring to the wind and referring to spirit. Also could mean breath. Usually in the New Testament, it's translated as the Spirit, like the Holy Spirit or our spirit inside of us. Sometimes, though, it's referred to as the wind, a breath. In, in, in English language, you would see the word pneuma in words like pneumonia. You know, the, uh, the air sacs are infected and can't breathe. We don't, can't breathe. Or like uh, a pneumatic drill, a drill that's powered by air or gas. So this word pneuma Jesus uses in a really a brilliant way. He'll say, the pneuma blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from, where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the pneuma. Pneuma, pneuma. And so you have to have ears to hear, to understand what Jesus is saying. I'm, re- I'm reminded of the time when Jesus uh, taught in parables, the parable of the sower. Do you remember this? Where he, the crowds were gathered and people were coming to hear what he had to say. And uh, he told the parable of the sower. He tells us the story of a farmer who comes along and is spreading his seed. And the seed he goes on, you know, uh, rocky land and it withers away. It goes, the seed lies on weeds and it gets choked up and dies. It, it goes on the path and the birds take it up. But then some seed goes on receptive soil. And the crops are multiplied. And that's it. That's, that's, that's all he taught. He just went there and ended there. And you can, you, can just imagine, you can just imagine the crowd. There might be hundreds, possibly thousands of people waiting to hear Jesus and what he has to teach. And he comes up, there's a farmer. Seed here, seed there, seed there. It didn't work out. Seed here, and well, crops multiplied. That's it. That's it. And you know what he, you remember what he says before he speaks that to? If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus functioned in a way where he relied on the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of the people he was speaking to, those who were hearing the word. That's how he functioned. And so in a similar way, he's doing this with Nicodemus. He's saying, if, if, if you get it, you're going to get it. But if you don't get it, man, you're not going to get it. And thus far in the passage, would we describe Nicodemus as somebody who has gotten it, 
who has been born again, who has been born of water and spirit? Tough to say. Maybe not quite. I, we would have doubts at the very least. But remember what the disciples did when they came back to Jesus after he preached that parable and they said, why are you preaching the, in parables to these people? And Jesus says, remember what he says? He refers back to Isaiah. He says, I do this to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah so that while seeing they may not see, while hearing they may not hear and understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be healed. Again, God is in the business of healing. And by the work of the Spirit, we can be. Having receptive and open hearts, we can be. And so what I believe Jesus is asking Nicodemus to surrender in this case is to surrender his work to the working of the Spirit. Perhaps you could put it this way. He's asking Nicodemus to surrender his leadership, his position for the leading of the Holy Spirit. So those are three ways that I could see Jesus asking Nicodemus to surrender. Now, the Nicodemus narrative in John doesn't end there. At the end of that chapter, um, it's, the dis discussion kind of just ends. Jesus says, you know, John 3.16 talks about some judgment, and there's no response given by Nicodemus at the end. It's just left kind of ambiguous. There's nothing, there's no decision by Nicodemus there that he, he saved that day or that he turned from God that day. There's no mention there. So we're left with some doubts. But actually, in the book of John, you'll see Nicodemus brought up two more times. In John chapter 7, Nicodemus is brought up uh, again as part of his religious leaders uh, group. And uh, the religious leaders were talking with Jesus and brought this, wanted to get the soldiers in to arrest Jesus. But the soldiers didn't do that at the time. And Nicodemus spoke up and said, hey, isn't it our law to hear what he is saying first and see what he is doing before we actually arrest him. And so the religious leaders start to scoff at him a little bit, say, are you also from Galilee? Are you a sympathizer as well? And so as an audience, we're left to wonder, hmm, I wonder if maybe Nicodemus is actually learning, is actually being open to the Spirit and being born anew, born from above and receiving the Spirit in there. And then later on, we see Nicodemus in near the end of the book. John writes about him after Jesus' death. We all know that, uh, that there was people who took on uh, Jesus' body to be, to be buried. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was one. And in John 19, it says also Nicodemus was with him to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. And Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and other spices for the preparation of the body. Now, again, I don't know how much a hundred pounds of myrrh is. I don't know if perhaps that's even some of the myrrh from Christ's, you know, birth when the, when the, when the Magi brought some. Not sure. But nonetheless, myrrh was meant to prepare the body of Christ. A hundred pounds, what I've learned, is that that's a significant amount that is, in fact, a significant amount to make the burial a royal burial. That's how much they would use for a, a royal person, a king, to be buried with. So you can see the heart of Nicodemus has probably grown in his love for Christ, has probably received more of the Spirit in this particular case. And the Apostle John, when he writes this book, shows this little narrative of Nicodemus here, popping up here, popping up there. And we're left to think, hmm, maybe Nicodemus did become a disciple of Christ. Maybe he did receive the Spirit. Maybe he did have that responsive uh, heart to the work of God. It's an interesting narrative, and, and I'll leave that narrative there with you today. So what do we say that Nicodemus was asked to respond or to surrender to? And I've got three things that I'd like to um, submit to you today. Nicodemus was asked, surrender your will for God's way. Surrender your understanding for God's wisdom. And surrender your striving for the Spirit's work and the Spirit's leading. Now again in the context, this is about being born again. 
So I would ask us then, you know, what is God asking us to surrender? Well, first of all, if we're talking about being born again and new life, um, if you're here and you have not received the Spirit, if you have not received that heart that's responsive, if you have not received Jesus as Lord, then that would be the first step. I would submit to you and encourage you. That's a great place to start. Explore more of that. Explore who Jesus is, the claims that he made of himself, and to respond appropriately. Many of us here in this room believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died, rose again, not just for, this, not just for our sins so that we could be guilt-free, but so that we could escape the judgment and wrath of God for that sin and live in the freedom that we have of that, the joy, the satisfaction of life. Secondly, if you know someone, maybe you know someone who has not yet accepted Christ as Lord. And you know what? This, this region is pretty blessed to have the Billy Graham Association coming through here. Um, in October, there's a celebration of Hope Weekend, the first weekend of October. You may have heard of that. We hosted a breakfast here in the Fellowship Hall back in January. Forty different churches were in the area that were represented at that breakfast to hear what the Billy Graham Association was here for and what they were about and, what, and what's going to happen. And then uh, last week, Thursday, we, we had a, a huge public launch here in this auditorium. Um, we're blessed to have a, a facility to be able to hold so many people, so that's why they've held those two events here. And we had almost 700 people in this room alone um, in terms of, of worship, of hearing what the Billy Graham Association is going to be doing, and in prayer, and uh, just a wonderful night of unity of the church. It was remarkable. And as we all know, Billy Graham himself was an evangelist. He, he, he led people to the Lord. That was his ministry, was large group stadium evangelism, telling people about Jesus and what he can do for them. And so the Billy Graham Association now has his grandson, Will Graham, who's going to be the speaker in October and will present something at the CAA Arena, um, uh, one night for kids and uh, one night for youth and adults. And we are called... Uh, we're asked by the Billy Graham Association to bring friends, pray for those who are coming. Um, in fact, um, we, we received information from packages about uh, how to even have discipleship, Christian life and witness courses, how to share your faith, how to share what Jesus, who Jesus is to you, to your friends. So if there are people that are on your mind who need that, well, there's a way, there's some training from one of the world's greatest uh, evangelism organizations. And they also have prayer meetings. There's a little pamphlet here on prayer. I'm not sure if any of this is in the, at the info desk or not, but if you need some more information on where these prayer meetings are being held and where these Christian life and uh, witness classes are happening, um, that stuff will be coming out fairly soon because that's an ongoing thing. It's a preparation for the celebration. So that's a place where we can surrender our prayer time. We can surrender our own just time to be trained in how to share our faith and how to invite people to an event like that. But also, thirdly, um, if we are, if you are born again, boy, the principle of surrender still applies. It still applies in our day-to-day -day life. It still applies to what we're doing. The details and little things Keep in tune with the Spirit's leading. Keep in touch with God and what He wants for your life. Not just even on a grand scheme, but also in the day-to-day -day stuff. I'll share, a, I'll share one personal example of how surrender worked for me in, in recent weeks. As you know, I, uh, one of my roles here at the church on staff is to oversee the rental of this facility and we have numerous groups that come through here and rent our facility. They rent this room, they rent the hall, they rent that hall, they rent classrooms. And uh, we had one particular group that has rented a long time ago. And uh, so part of my real role and responsibility there is, you know, send a, a, an, an invoice. Here's how much the rental fee was and pay for the staffing that we, that we had for sound and for custodian. And 
This one particular group, well, they hadn't paid in a while. It's been a few months. And so I uh, periodically, I'll go on my calendar and see, oh, who has yet to, who's outstanding still? And this one group was still outstanding. So I sent a reminder email. Here's another invoice just to, you know, just to keep you reminded of that need, that outstanding balance, trying to be as polite as possible. But there's a seed of, a seed of resentment that sort of grew in me. Because month after month after month, this group had not yet paid their outstanding balance owed to us. And I got just frustrated with it. And my emails turned to ignored emails. My phone calls turned to ignored phone calls. And now it's getting personal. Why aren't you returning my phone call? I'm getting a little bit resentful here. And even twice I visited their office on a, uh, to talk to the person in, in, in person, and face to face. Never talked to the organizer because they weren't available, but talked to one of their staff at the, 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 their front desk. Say, hey, here's this. Can you please have them call me? Didn't hear back from them. And the, the craziest thing is that it's a place where in my typical you know, weekly routine, I'll drive by that office many times a week. <laughs> so, so driving by this place and having this, oh, this resentment in me. I was like, what is going on? I, uh, why aren't they calling back? What's their problem? What's the deal here? And I, that's the way I approached it for many months. And so one day, I was driving out that way, and it was in the evening time. And I drove past their office again. And I, I don't know. I don't even know if it was me. But I began to pray for the first time. First time, hey, maybe I should pray about it. And I pray, God, not even about them. God, why, why does this bother me so much? What's, what is it in me that this, this irks me? And just immediately, I heard the parable of the unforgiving servant. And it wasn't like I was like, okay, God, what would be a good Bible passage that relates to this situation here? No, I wasn't thinking that way at all. I was just offering it in prayer, saying, God, why does this bother me? Parable of the unforgiving servant. And immediately, spiritual revelation was there. And I was like, oh. And it, was, it became introspective. It became about me and my unforgiving nature, my unforgiveness to that, to that group. And I was able to, at that point, realize it and be able to give it up and surrender it. And very few times has that kind of happened to me where that immediate response from the Holy Spirit comes and just like, boom. And maybe you've had those experiences too. Maybe you've had those just immediate spiritual revelations from the Holy Spirit. If so, that's great. But it was in the act of surrendering. It was in the act of just giving it up in prayer saying, praying, God, help. <laughs> and so for me, I found that uh, there are two things that I know that I can practice to, to give up, to remain humble, to remain in that surrendered mode is, is A, pray. When in doubt, just pray about it. That's a practice that we can do. That's a routine that we can do. And B, just, just memorize the word and recall the word those are other things that we can do that's simple. The, the routine of life, have a Bible passage on your mirror or in your car or wherever it is that's helpful to remind you of our state, who we are, who God is, and the things that we need to surrender to Him. For me, the passage is John 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, and He will lift you up. Resist the devil, and He'll flee from you. That passage has stuck to me um, since a teenager. And in fact, that passage is, again, it's a reference to an Old Testament passage in Proverbs, Proverbs 3.23. And in fact, Peter quotes that passage in one of his letters too. So for in my mind, if there's a passage that's three times repeated in the Word, maybe that's something worth memorizing and learning and, and keeping as, as yours. So that's why that one has stuck to me. So in, in terms of what might help you, 
What is God asking you to surrender, maybe even today? Remember first that surrendering is just that grace, having the grace to let go at the right moment and offering it to God so that you can receive and give back to God, so that you can fulfill His will. So here's some questions just for self-reflection as we close. Are you able to recognize that you're not in control of everything? Can you admit that you're not right? Whether it's right opinions or right theology or right standing before God. Can you be spontaneous and not have to plan every last detail? Can you enjoy life and stop long enough to let enjoyment in? Because remember, when we surrender to God, we do find that full satisfaction, that joy of life that God offers when we walk His ways, when we surrender our ways for His. God does oppose the proud, but He does give grace to the humble. May we be so. Please stand with me for prayer. Our Father God in heaven, again, we just praise you for the work that you do, that you cleanse us from our guilt, that you give us soft, responsive hearts, that you give us your Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, that you sent Jesus as a Savior as a redeemer. Thank you that you offer healing. Thank you that you offer freedom. Thank you that you offer joy, satisfaction in life in you. God, as we take a moment now, we ask that the Spirit would move and just reveal to us what it is that we might surrender to you today. God, we praise you for all that you do, for your faithfulness, and may we be faithful back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.